Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice. Oh, man. Coach Ferraro from Clarion is going to be our guest tonight on the Barbarian Hour. I am pumped. Coach Ferraro, eighth year as the head man at Clarion in Pennsylvania? Yeah, eighth year. How many years total on staff? I've been here 10. 10. So were you under Dernlin for, for a year? No, nah, the way it worked actually was um, – so Derns came from Penn State to Clarion and brought Troy Letters with him. Okay. And Troy and I were close. We spent a long time working together. And actually, we wrestled together as kids at Waller's camps. That's how I got to know from Troy. And then we worked for Waller, which is a pretty crazy experience in itself. Old man Waller. You were for yeah. Old Man Waller. And uh, Troy and well, I were. That guy's camps good. I like Old Man Waller. Yeah, he's one of my favorite people on earth. Love him. He's a good dude, and um, I could tell stories for the next five hours about Coach Waller, but that's how I got to know Troy, and uh, when Troy had an opening for an assistant, when he got the head job, he hired me, and I'm local, so I'm in a unique situation where I grew up kind of in this area and, and had a lot of local contacts, uh, so it made it a pretty natural transition, and I was teaching and coaching at the high school level at the time and I didn't really love it. You know, I was kind of fed up with working in the schools and Troy knew that because we were close and he had a chance to bring me on. So he did. And, you know, you never, the, the world works in crazy ways. And, you know, when he left, I got the job and, um, you know, always thankful to that guy for giving me a shot, getting me, getting me started at the college level. And it's been a pretty crazy ride that I never could have predicted. So was it, it went TIG? It went Dernlin, it went Letters, it went Ferraro. Is that the progression? Did I get that right? That's it, yeah. In a pretty quick succession, honestly. So, uh, you know, that was the – at the time I got hired, that was one of the, the hopes of, you know, the boosters around the program and the administration here was just to stabilize things because there had been a lot of turnover in staff and that was concerning. So – that was one thing that helped, you know, that I was local and, and it definitely helped make my case for the job because, you know, they could be confident that I'd be here for a long term, long term stay, which I have and I'm loving it. And uh, obviously when you're when you're coaching a division one wrestling team in your hometown, it's a hard thing to leave. You know, it's a pretty special thing. Where were you coaching? First of all, okay, where did you go to high school? Where were you coaching I, and where were you living? So I, I was, I grew up in Brookville, Brookville, Pennsylvania, coached in Brookville. Well, I, I went to Lock Haven and after I finished up school, uh, I did some short-term coaching positions, other places and ended up in back in Brookville coaching at, and teaching at Brookville. And then uh, that's where I was at when Troy got the job here at Clarion. So Brookville's like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It's I didn't even move close. when I got the job. You didn't have to move. I didn't even have to move. I still live in my same house I was in when I was teaching. So that what's crazy about that is, is like there's there's not like Goodell did that, Dresser did that, right? And then you did that. Okay? Very short like, list of guys. It's a super short list of guys who have gone yeah. from the high school ranks because it's just so hard to do. But if there's if you want to talk about an, the, the easiest transition, it would be a PA guy, a guy who's coaching P, and, and Brookville's tough, right? Yeah, well, um, it, at times I was there at the, you know, the best times in the program's history and the worst times. So just the way it worked out. And um, when I was in high school, we were very, very good. And, 
And then uh, by the time I finished up college and moved into a coaching role there, we were very, very bad. And so that, and I worked uh, with a guy under a guy, uh, Dave Klepfer, who is, is still there. He's awesome. And I learned a lot from him and watched him rebuild that program. So that was like pretty enlightening for me as a young coach. And, and honestly, probably prepared me best of all the things I've seen in the sport of wrestling. If, you know, my time with Dave Klepfer probably prepared me best for what to expect when it was time to try to build a college program into a, you know, a better culture that, that with a winning program. So, because at the time when, when I took over at Clarion, we were, we were one in 16 that season. So with no national qualifiers, you know, we weren't very good. And, uh, if you haven't been through that before, it's uh, it requires a level of patience that most most coaches like aren't ready for, just don't have it without you know kind of learning that from somebody else, and that helped me a lot because I I was ready for it. I really believe that as as tough as it is and as lonely as it is to try to build a program, I was kind of ready. Your transition, like I'm just saying, like Clarion in general, Clarion University of Pennsylvania, the only sport your division one in is wrestling, correct? Yep. Okay. So I believe Lock Haven is like that, except for women's field hockey, maybe. That's accurate. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Bloom's the same way, I believe. Yep. Uh, they might be D1 in uh, women's field hockey. They might be as well. Um, I don't think, but I don't know the, that for sure. The, I don't know that one for sure, but I know Lock Haven is, okay? And then um, Edinburgh is the same way. You got it. And then everybody else who's transitioned down to D2, Millersville, uh, Shippensburg, Kutztown, those teams have transferred. They were one at one point, and then they've all shifted down to D2. Is that accurate? I believe that's accurate. Some of them before I was old enough to really pay attention. But yeah. I believe they were all Division East I. East Stroudsburg was the same way. Yeah. So I believe all of them did that at one point or another, and then now they've, they've shifted down to D2. So what's rare about you guys, it's funny, I've been having these conversations with uh, Andy Rovat about <laughs> the service academies, and he mentioned uh, he made a comparison to Edinburgh and the service academies, and I said, Andy, it's a very different thing. You know, he's, you know, his argument is they can develop, they should be developing guys how Tim Flynn developed guys. You know, like when, you know, Flynn was third, right? They were third at Edinburgh. They had a bunch of top 10 finishes. I'm yep. like, you're, you're talking about very different people. You're talking yeah. about very different academics. Possibly a goat. I mean, Flynn, the, Flynn yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, what he did there it's unreal. is, and, and it, it's, it's, I'll tell you who, who I think of a lot when people talk about Flynn, he is uh, Bobber, Coach Bob at Clarion. Now it was a different generation and, Probably a lot of people that are listening to this aren't old enough to really understand, but Coach Bob at Clarion did a very comparable thing to what, and maybe, and honestly, for a longer period of time. Than what Way been. longer period of time. Okay, so for po people who don't know, Coach Bob Bub, the National Coach of the Year Award is named after Bob Bub. Bob Bub, Bub was the longtime head coach for Clarion in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Um, for the, the Clarion Golden Eagles in Western Pennsylvania. And like, like I said, I, I don't know if much more needs to be said. He coached. Um, so I think it was, was Shallas? Did he coach Shallas? Coach Shallas, Shallas yeah. Shallas, Kurt Angle. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, and his transition really out would have been, he, Kurt was towards the end of his career, but uh, definitely coached both of those guys. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. And then if you look at that, um, the first time you had, you guys had two NCAA champions with Shallas and who was the other one? Gary Barton. So they won together, right? Same year. Okay. Yeah. You guys aren't in the top 10 because you weren't eligible as a team because you were a different division. Yeah. And I don't, I, I would love to go back and learn all about that because I hear people say that and I don't really understand the structure at the time. Well, I think uh, it was, was like, like there was a, there was a national division and a college division, right? And they, what, what it was, it was like when D2s and D3s, like what Hasselbeck did, right? Yeah. Um, I, I know Mark Haywald did it in D3 for John Carroll. I and mean, those are just examples that jump off the top of my head, right? 
and, and that was when you could wrestle up a division when you wrestled in your when you wrestled in your nationals. So I believe that was like three weekends in a row of championship tournaments for those guys. Yeah. That's insane, dude. When you think yeah. about that, that is completely insane. It's, it's nuts to <laughs> think that, you know, the grind of the Division One National Tournament, and then to think about, like, you had to qualify for that thing, like, immediately before by winning your national tournament. Yes, you had to win your Crazy. division to qualify. And what those guys did was – what it's incredible to think about it man it blows my mind i'm like oh my god and you're because you're I, I don't know if you've been to the d2s push ferraro but it, it's no joke yeah i would love it's to watch tournament. that event sometime it's just, uh, for obvious well, reasons yeah, you can't. it's never gonna match up for you you know what i mean yeah. and the thing about it with you guys is you guys can have guys transition up guys can transfer and you could actually go and recruit that tournament with what it's what's crazy about that whole thing Maybe not very ethically, but well, yeah, you know, I mean, you get what I'm saying. You could go have your eyes on people. I mean, yeah, you're not gonna go. Yeah. You're not gonna go to the D2s and recruit, but you're gonna watch the matches. Why wouldn't you? Oh yeah, man. It's in front I, of your face. Come the on. The thing is, like, uh, you know, I get this a lot. Um, I mean, I've coached five year olds and twenty five year olds uh, at diff all different times in my life, and people just assume like that when you're a division one wrestling coach, you just see this high level wrestling and nothing else really is interesting to you. There's nothing I would rather watch than two eighth graders at 110 in a junior high dual meet with people going nuts when the duel's on the line and they're putting each other on their back. I just love wrestling. I love watching it at all levels. I, you know, it's exciting. It's exciting. I mean, when I retire from this job, I would love to go watch the Division Two Nationals. I would have no problem going to that event flying in. It's yeah. awesome. I'm going to tell you right now because there's a ton of parody. That's the other thing I like about it. Um, you'll have unseated guys win all the time. You know, like about every other year, you're going to have unseated guys win. It's, it's you know, That's it's not amazing. like – I think what we have Mark Branch was an unseated guy who won, and um, there's like one or two so other So few teams. that we talk about them. You know, we're able to kind of rattle them off. <laughs> yeah, isn't that crazy? Visual level. Yeah, when I went to the D2s, an un I commentated the 2014s, and somebody unseated won it. And it's, like, crazy, man. It's crazy to think about it. I'm like, this guy's not even seated. So, it, it's awesome. And, and I think that um, with the parody, you know, it's just so crazy. But what's wild is a lot of the teams that used to wrestle D1 in the PSAC, the, the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission, I believe, is the proper – uh, what the what the acronym actually stands for, right? Are you guys no longer allowed to compete in the wrestling PSAX? So I don't know that legislatively there's anything that keeps us out of it, but what here's how kind of it transpired. When we were in the EWL for a long time and then we were also competing in the PSAC tournament, there was a big debate among all the institutions in the PSAC about whether we the D1s should compete against the D2s. Very mixed feelings. My opinion of it changed throughout those years. We fought for a while to keep the event intact with all the schools that were in the PSAC that sponsored wrestling. And then as that debate was kind of coming to a head, we moved to the MAC. And when we moved to the MAC, there was just enough of an appetite at that point to say, you're done in the PSAC, you're done competing in the tournament, you're a MAC, you're a MAC institution when it comes to wrestling. And it really did kind of simplify everything for everybody. Um, so that's kind of when it ended. And, you know, it, it was a cool tournament. And I think the tradition of it was hard to let go for a lot of people. And, and I get it. I, you know, I, I didn't want to see it end. I was one of those people. But it, it, made, sense. it made sense when we went to the MAC to make that move. I covered a couple of PSAC tournaments. I actually just found the videos from like uh, 09, 10, and 11. I covered all those PSAC tournaments, and it was always a December championship. Is that right? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah and, it, you know, there were just – there's a million things that made the event, like, uh, controversial, whether we should be doing it or not. And even the timing of it was one of those things, you know. And, and the D2 institutions, I think it would have made more sense for them to move it back in their year, but the D1 schools didn't want that for, you know, obvious reasons. There's a lot going on later. Uh, but it was cool. And, and honestly, you know, I'm friends with a lot of those guys who coach at the D2 schools in Pennsylvania. So it was, it was a great time to see them all, you know, compete against them. And then, you know, now I, don't, I really don't get to see those guys a whole lot, and guys that I consider friends. So. You, you know, just like anything else in life, you move on and, you know, different circles. 
it, okay, so we talk about the, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s Clarion teams. All the D1s that are still remaining it, that are former PSAC schools, well, they're actually currently still PSAC schools that don't participate in that, that wrestling championships. Bloomsburg, Lock Haven, Clarion, and Edinburgh. All of them at one point or another in the last 35 or 40 years have had top five finishes, top 10 finishes in the NCAA tournament. You had the Bonomo brothers at Bloom, right? Yep. You had, uh, obviously, Colat and Coach Rogers were on the same team in the yeah. late 90s for Lock Haven. Yeah, you guys I think did Lock was, Haven finished fifth once. They were fifth that year, right? Yeah. Obviously, yeah. 2015, uh, the, the recency bias, Tim Flynn and Port, uh, AJ Shop, uh, Vic Avery, Dave Habit was in the final. I mean, they had an, an incredible team. Obviously, I brought up, um, you know, we talked er, Eric Burnett and uh, Kurt Angle were all Americans in 92, and you guys finished seventh, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Clarion, Clarion was fifth uh, earlier on. That was probably the highest finish, but. Uh, but, and then there were those years where maybe the score didn't count because of the reasons you discussed earlier. But, um, yeah, seventh sounds right that 92 year that, that Kurt won. No, I'm telling you. I'm not asking. Oh, you're, you're right. Telling okay. You. I, I, I'm I, telling I, you they were seventh. Yeah. Because awesome. I talked to Eric a lot. Obviously, he's one of my best friends, Eric Burnett. Obviously, uh, he just got inducted into your guys' Hall of Fame. Just an awesome guy. He's a rock guy. star, man. Yeah, he's awesome man. guy. They don't make him better as, as far as people, but – you know, so I have a pretty good, a firm grasp on the type of guy Bob Bob was, and then I, I obviously did work with um, uh, Tig when Tig was the head coach. When uh, I actually had a contract, my my Ohio cast, we had a contract. Did you? I don't know if you know this. We had a contract with the EWL for for uh, three years, and then it was uh, we created a website. It was when Martin Floriani was just figuring out kind of like how is flow wrestling going to make money? Right. So I was like this affiliate, uh, Jared Offer and I started go cast and we provided, uh, two home duels ended up being some teams got more home duels than others for the Eastern wrestling league. And it was something that really like, you know, I opened my eyes on contracts and, uh, working with people and obviously delivering on your word. And it was when WVU and Pitt were in the conference and Cleveland state were in the conference. And I bought a two hundred dollars Subaru car and drove it forty one thousand miles in two years. That's a great story. So I learned a lot, and I was, you know, obviously I knew a lot about the EWL, and just made some pretty amazing relationships with those guys, and it was fun. I really enjoyed that conference, and that's when I learned a lot about Pennsylvania wrestling, and um, the theory that um, the the prevailing theory lately. I don't know if you can confirm or give me your opinion on it, Coach Ferraro, but all those schools are teacher schools, right? So a lot of them have great education programs. Then you have guys wrestling in D1 who are going back and they're teaching this wrestling that they wrestled in the PSAC. They wrestled in the Eastern Wrestling League. And then a lot of them obviously were Division One All-Americans, qualifiers, and a bunch of different levels. But the big thing is those are teaching schools, right? The big thing is people go there to be teachers. And then they're taking these high level of wrestling back. You guys have this high level of mat wrestling, especially. And they're taking it back and they're teaching it to elementary, middle school, and high school kids. Would you agree? That, is that an accurate take? That's the model that I think got us where we're at. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would tell you a concern I have. It's not really related to wrestling, though. Is I think – people figured out teaching is a, is a really not a great move finding, uh, you know, as far as what you have to put yourself through and what you make and what you, what it costs to get a degree to do it. And um, I think we're underproducing school teachers right now. And that's I, actually factual. We know that for a fact right now, um, post COVID you've had so many people leave education because you just stated all the reasons that are, you nailed it. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a thing that I think we got to get ready for. I, this is kind of off topic, but like, I, I'll tell you where it comes back to topic is as the head coach at an institution like this, that's a traditional teacher school. I want that model to continue, right? I've run camps. I want my guys to go get a teaching job, coach a high school team, bring their kids to camp. The whole thing just kind of feeds itself. Right. I've been here 10 years and only graduated a couple teachers. And that wow. you, coach Bob could never say that. 
you know, uh, Jack Davis could never say that. Ken Nellis could never say that. Those guys were producing teacher after teacher after teacher because it was a logical move to go to a state institution, get a teaching degree, go get a teaching job and have a pretty good lifestyle. But it's a tough job. It's, it's getting tougher. And it's, uh, you know, I, I worry about it, honestly. Um, I worry about it. And, you is know, it's Robson such an important Tobin, role. Is Robson Tobin still a teacher in the area? Yeah. He was he's, an All-American uh, in, I think, 94, 94, 95? That sounds right, yeah. Yeah. So, Rob, is, uh, is he PE? No, I, th I think he is middle or secondary – don't I don't remember. Maybe what science. were you? What were you, Coach Ferrar? I was health and cassette. You were health and PE. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I know that stint. I did a little driver's ed in there. Oh, did you? But it was it was not probably what I should have been teaching. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now, I'm actually uh, transitioning jobs. Um, I'm going to career based intervention from social studies. From uh, I was a 2003 graduate at Kent State, and um, I don't think I graduated with any other teachers. I did not. And we had like seven seniors that graduated with me, no other teachers. Now that I'm like, I'm like thinking about it. I didn't graduate with any other seniors who were education. It just made sense for me because my dad was an iron worker and I don't want anything to do with iron work. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it's you really learn, learn sometimes. My dad was a health and phys ed teacher and he said, don't do it. And I ignored him. And then I, and then I wasn't happy. Yeah. I have a brother who's a, a high school teacher and I have a sister who's a guidance counselor. So it's like, ah. And I'm the youngest of five. So, um, and they used, they both got pretty good setups, right? And then my brother owns a business on top of it. But my oldest brother, Ferd, uh, Ian's dad, Ian Miller's dad. Yeah. He is a uh, iron worker. And then my brother, Tate, is a crane operator. So, you know, and then my dad did iron work for 50 plus years. His dad did iron work for 50 plus years. So, you know what I mean? There's the, we're, what we're focusing on, and you're not off topic when you say that this is like obviously very relevant to what the, the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission schools, the model is their education, their, their, their teacher schools. That's the whole point of what we're talking about, yeah. right? And Traditionally, yeah. Yeah, and, and what we're moving to now, what education is moving to now, and what, what, at least what my new job career-based intervention is, we're trying to prepare kids for whatever angle they want to take as far as if they want to do career, if they want to do technical school, if they want to do trades and become a journeyman, right? Yeah. Um, or if they want to go to that, that four-year institution, because, um, you know, as you know, you work at a school. Well, this isn't very true of the, the, the PSEC schools that I've worked with. They're very affordable. Like I always make the joke. I'm like, Hey, I want to get my kids to commit to go to Edinburgh now. <laughs> Cause it's, it's so freaking affordable yeah it's not super expensive they don't rip your face off at edinburgh you guys are similar to that you're not ripping yeah, the face off uh, you know definitely a conscious ever effort right now to make it more affordable you know basically that's you know kind of the the, the wheels are in motion to do that and uh, not everybody likes the route we're taking to do it but um you know you have to be appealing in some way and, and if you have if you get to an environment where private schools are competitive with state institutions uh you got a problem you know what i mean like that's kind of our thing is to be able to provide people with high quality education at an affordable price and if it's not any more affordable than the competitors then you know you're not strategically in a good position for you know so this is kind of crazy eric burnett is literally from oberlin ohio Eric, Scotty, and their sister Jenny, they grew up literally off the campus of Oberlin College. Do you know anything about Oberlin College? I, I'm not familiar with Oberlin. It is ravenously super liberal, like very, yeah. very liberal. And, and a lot of colleges are, we understand that. Yeah. Um, but that school is, if you pay, it, it's more than all the Ivies. I think they're sitting at like 78 or 80 grand right now. Oh, wow. To go full. So Eric Burnett was a four-time state champ at Oberlin High School. And if you can get into Oberlin uh, College and you live in Oberlin, you go for free. Oh, wow. No, yeah, that's crazy, right? It's wow. crazy. I, that, I, that one might be a myth, but I know for a fact I look because, you know, I, ta I, I, teach, I teach about careers. Yeah. And we were looking at, and a lot of that obviously becomes need-based. Um, and that's yeah. what the Ivies have going on. It's need-based. Um, 
so you don't pay, uh, you know, unless you're like Steve Jobs' kid or whatever, you're not paying usually the full $75,000 or seventy eight grand to go to Penn, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, right? Mm-hmm. We know that. So that, that that's the big thing that they have going for them. They have, they have financial aid packages, right? And it's based off your FAFSA and all that. So uh, the business end of it, I really, I'm, I'm not a super big fan of the, the business end and the, and the for-profit education, like what we're talking about right now. And you guys are not doing that as much as other schools. Yeah. Clarion's not doing that. Yeah, I like that. Just, I like know, that. It, I'm a fan. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's important. I mean, if you, if you want people to go out and, you know, if, you, if you're going to expect somebody to get a four, well, in this case, you need a master's degree to be a teacher in most states by the time it's all said and done with continuing ed. And if you want master's level people to teach your kids, but then, I mean, they're generating two, four, six hundred thousand dollars in debt, depending on where they go to get a teaching degree. Yeah. Then you got to pay them to pay off their debt. And then, we, then it becomes, then your, your public schools don't, aren't sustainable anymore, you know? So it's a, it's a very interesting thing. If we don't have these state institutions to provide career or, you know, uh, degrees to the people we need in our schools, then we have a problem. So it's a very important part of at least our state, and I'm sure a lot of other states, their public education systems. I bet you you just learned more about Oberlin, Ohio, than you could ever imagine. Well, uh, I kind of, <laughs> yeah, I loved hearing that. And honestly, before we move off, and I, I'll say your job sounds real interesting, like a transition, helping kids transition from from school to whatever their next thing is. Yeah, and we're getting them jobs in the community is the end goal of it. And, and, and then eventually we're going to try and offer this to more students than students who seem to be uh, taking a different route, I guess, an alternative route. I guess is what we're kind of creating here. And it used to be called like OWA, OWE. I don't know if you remember that, Occupational Work Education. That was a program when I was in high school. Keith, when did you graduate high school, by the way? 99. 99. So I'm a year older than you in high. I'm a 98 grad. So so it was a OWA, OWE, and now they've transitioned it into CBI career-based intervention. So it's cool. I really enjoy it. I'm pumped. I'm glad that I got, you know, an education degree from Kent State. My wife got an education degree from Kent State. Um, our in-laws are, uh, my wife's sister's a teacher. Our brother-in-law is a teacher. So, I mean, obviously my brother and my sister's a guidance counselor. So, I mean, education is a big part of my family. And everybody was raised by, well, my mother-in-law was a teacher for 35 years. Um, <clears throat> she taught at Ludwig's High School, Coach Ludwig. Oh, yeah? Yeah, she taught at uh, Ludwig's High School. He actually told the story about one of my mother-in-law's colleagues killed the superintendent and shot and wounded the principal and was shooting at his union rep. And Ludwig was in the high school when the SWAT came and cleared the school. Come on. No, I, dude, you can't, I cannot be making it up. Oh, wow. Yes. Ludwig told it on the Barbarian Hour. I mean, it's crazy, dude. And my mother in law was pulling crazy. in and waved at the guy because the guy, they were, it was a disciplinary meeting because the guy was this real erratic, bizarre guy. And um, they were disciplining him. And his union rep was there to defend him. Ironically, one of the people he shot at. Um, wow. and, and my mother-in-law said they did not miss school the next day. That's what how people wild. And Ludwig was like a sophomore. That's crazy. Dude, how wild is that? He told that story on this show. And I was like, Oh my, I was like, dude, does it make you sick to think about the, the eminent danger you were basically in? And he's like, I never even, I've never even thought about it really because it was such a crazy thing. Yeah, the guy rolled up, and that school, it's, it's called um, Chelsea, Michigan. Uh, Ludwig was a state champ for Chelsea High. It's uh, West Ann Arbor, like 20 minutes. My wife went to Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor. And um, it's a California, it was a California-styled school in Ann Arbor, west of Ann Arbor, 20 minutes. And the schools were like these outside trailers. And her, my uh, mother-in-law's room was right next to um, – the guy who committed the murder, um, just wild. I mean, it blew my mind, blew, like blew my mind. And Ludwig, I believe has, he has an education background as well. All you guys do. Oh, most of you guys I talk to have some type of, uh, uh, education degrees, Win Mahalik, same thing. So, I mean, I do like that about it. And that's what you guys are doing. You're preparing people. Uh, Andersy talked about it. How much harder is it being a dad 
and a coach than it is to being an athlete and just being a student athlete? How much harder is that like for you as you personally is, is it, is it a lot harder being a dad and a coach than it was being an athlete? It's just, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, if you want to be successful, whatever you're doing, you're working hard, you know? So like the difference, you know, obviously it's, a, it's to be an athlete, a student athlete, college level is extremely, it's a grind, you know? So it's a different kind of hard, but like the thing, when you have a family and you're trying to do this career, uh, the thing you're doing is like, you max out, you know, you're going to max out your time and you got to find a balance that works with your family and your job and everything. And then what I think once you reach that point where you, you hit that sweet spot and it's different for everybody. I mean, I, I've seen single assistants who can work 80, 80 hours a week consistently. Some guys might need to back it down to 50, 60, you know, some guys probably try to get done on 40. Um, but what happens is when you reach that point where like you kind of are putting in what, what you feel is the maximum amount, then you got to try to get efficient, you know? And that's where like, I think um, people really excel in this job is just how are you spending your 60 hours? If that's what you can put in a week or your 50 hours or your 70 hours. And if you get, um, you, you know, cause there's a lot of people that work really hard doing things that don't need done, you know? And they spend a lot of time procrastinating on things that, are urgent and they just put them off. So, um, yeah, I would just say that that's kind of where I'm at in my career right now is just trying to find the waste, you know, why, where am I spending effort that isn't helping me or my program and where do I, where, I mean, I, it's pretty evident to me when I'm failing to get something done that should be getting done. And then, so when you identify it, you got to find time, to use to get it done and that has to come from somewhere so what do you give up you know and that's kind of like the thing i'm wrestling with now as a you know as a coach who's trying to do better and, and build a program and you know family is part of that my, luckily my family's great they get it and you know i try to be efficient with my time when i'm not working and um spend quality time with those guys i love spending time with them so that helps as you know i see see what you do with your kids and we live pretty similar lifestyles in that sense we like to travel and, and uh do a lot of things together but yeah it's it's a different kind of hard you know it's just um you know and then and then you, you try to balance the stress that's associated with a job like this and not take it home to the family that's another challenge but i think that's something that you know you just any professional employee, anybody that works hard in life, there, you know, there's every job has stress and, uh, you know, you got to get good at dealing with it and, you know, trying to control the things that you can control and not stress about the things that you can't. Um, but it's, it's a hard job, but I'll tell you what, compared to teaching, I just love it. Compa you know, I am having a blast and I'm finding like, I, we have a great team right this year. You know, I think we're, we're better competitively, which is going to be enjoyable, but they're just awesome kids. I'm, I'm not dealing with headaches. I, they are, this is about as much fun as I've ever had coaching. And it makes something, a job that's pretty hard seem a hell of a lot easier when you surround yourself with awesome people. So, you know, first of all, how old are your kids? 11. I have two sons, 11 and nine, and then my daughter's five. 11 nine and five. Oh my god and we're done <laughs> you're in the heat of it right now dude you are in like the belly of the beast man you got a pre-teenager oh my godness oh I'm quick. Dude, you, you him how do the two boys get along <clears throat> they hate each other oh now i mean i don't know that but they fight uh constantly constantly fight yeah, I, I know I'm the youngest of five, and I had a brother who was two years older than me, and uh, there was a lot of fist fights. And are they both wrestling right now? They are, and I built a wrestling room, but they're like, they're bit. There's enough size difference that they can't really like wrestle, so it's just not ideal in any way, you know. But they got the space to do it, but somebody always ends up trying. Fist fight. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I got boxing gloves for him. Oh my God. Dude, you're a maniac. I love it. I love it. Uh, how are you treating it as a, as a dad coach? How are you treating it? Are, are, are they competing a lot? Are you letting them do their own thing? How, how are you treating as a dad coach? Cause you coach at such a high level, man. The D one level is the, I just don't know if a lot of people get it. I kept saying that to coach Anderson when they had him on a lot of parents that you're, you're doing recruiting, they, they, they don't get what the commitment level is for their kids. Even PA parents don't get it. It's wild for me to think that, oh, I know a lot of Ohio parents don't get it. How are you treating the sons wrestling right now? Well, I was coached by my dad. So I had insight growing up, and he was awesome. He was really great at what he did. And he was great with me, um, so it helped. And, and I, I'm around, like, people that are extremely serious about wrestling. And I see, I mean, that's who I recruit. I see how their parents interact with them. And I see, you know, you see a lot of mistakes. And uh, quite frankly, I mean, this is something that, I, I, you know, I don't ever want to make it easy on my kids to not be as great as they can be. But the reality is, all, statistically, almost nobody statistically is good enough to wrestle at the Division One level. You know, like that's something we aren't very honest with our, our young wrestlers about is it's you're a very, very, very small sliver of our sport. It's actually like the the level of eliteness you have to be to be a division one roster member is like, I don't even want to say it because people would think I'm crazy. But if not you, even you a money to, guy. Hold on. Hold on. I want you to expound upon that. Not even a money guy. I'm glad that you're talking about this right now. Because a lot of people really don't get it. They re like <laughs> are clueless, don't get it. Just to yeah. be a rostered individual. What's your what's your number? What's your roster number right now? We're at 35. So 35. Okay. So let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. You got 35 with with Clarion in Pennsylvania. You got 22 at Northwestern. And everybody else is right about in there, right? Everybody yeah. else is right in, in between Northwestern. And clearing. Now, there's some of those, like, if you look at Campbell, they got a massive roster. Obviously, the service academies have ra massive rosters because everybody's on a – they're earning a full scholarship through their service to the United States of America, right? They yeah. have massive um, – and I think some of the Ivies have pretty big um, rosters, right? I'm, I'm correct, and I feel right in those numbers, yeah? Yeah. Talk about that, though. Talk about, you know, you're coaching your kids – and you're also looking at the other end of the spectrum. You're coaching yeah. at the highest level in D Division One. Talk about just getting being a rostered individual, not a money guy, a rostered individual on a D1, a D1 team. Yeah, well, I mean, so, like, I guess I'll say this. I think my role right now for them is, is just being a dad that tries to get them to fall in love with the sport because, you know, and, and at times, I, I, to a fault, like, I should work with my kids more honestly, you know what I mean? But I don't ever want, uh, they're not old enough yet for me to put that kind of pressure on them. Like I expect, I just want them to love it, you know? And at the end of the day, if they end up wanting to put the time in and have the skill set that they can be great and wrestle at the, after high school and they want to do it, I, I would love that. I will support them. But the reality is my kids are wrestling for the same reason anybody else's kids are wrestling because it's the, best way to learn how to be a great person and uh you know you don't have to be a division one wrestler or a college wrestler at all to to get those beneficial lessons that you know the countless number of presidents and leaders and ceos who attribute their success to the sport of wrestling those people weren't all college athletes they weren't you know even some of them weren't even good but they learned important lessons in the sport and that's why my kids are in it they're not in it because i'm a college wrestling coach or in it because I think it's a great sport. I want them to love it. And, um, you know, the, the amount, if you look at it statistically, the amount of people who uh, end up wrestling in college is pretty small. Though I will say the one thing we're doing right now as a sport, uh, we've just totally hacked and annihilated our division one, division two institution or um, programs, but we're doing a great job of growing at the lower levels. Now at the NAI level, division three level, I think is growing. Obviously, women, it's outstanding what's going on, which will in turn save the men's side. Um, but it, so I would say this, if you want to wrestle in college, if there's a kid out there that 
maybe isn't the greatest, there's a place for you. There's a, if you if you set your sights on it and you say it's important to yourself, um, there's a there's great opportunities. And you know, I'm, I'm just one. I'm just coaching at one of those opportunities, but there's a lot. And um, obviously, the opportunity to wrestle at the Division One level is a special thing. We try to remind our guys of that a lot. That they're uh, they should have some gratitude for just the ability to be where they're at and enjoying the sport that they love at, at such a high level because they really are elite that, you know, even the average guy at this level is a, is an elite athlete. Talk about that, that uh, just being a rostered guy, talk about like, you know, we're discussing that obviously do a lot of the kids you recruit, how like, do you get a lot of deer in the headlights with parents? Yeah. What is, what is the understanding level of what division one commitment is? I think in general, all student, I mean, you go talk to go down to the softball field and talk to any parent there. Every parent probably is a little bit uh, skewed on how, the, the talent level or the ability level of their kid. That's just, I probably am. You probably, well, it's just human nature to be like that. But um, you see it when you recruit them, uh, especially when you start, start talking about money. And, and you hit on it. I mean, there's 35 athletes on my team, you know, and, and that's a big team. But even the smaller teams, they're limited to 9.94 rides. So you're talking uh, on a sm the smallest teams in the country, 20 roster members. Half the kids, if you put 9.9 nine guys on four rides, then you got half your teams on no money, you know. Or, so, you know, it's, it's never like that. It's distributed some way. Every program does it differently. but. Um, I'll say this, there's a lot of walk-ons in the sport of wrestling. There's a lot of them. And I was, uh, I can tell you, I was, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of good ones. A lot of really good ones. Yeah. Um, it, it's crazy to think about it. Um, it's just so hard, man. It's just so hard that the grind, the cutting weight, the going to classes, I mean, you're there to get a degree, not to become a professional wrestler. That's, that's the other thing that people lose focus of. They lose focus that you use this vehicle of wrestling to get you through the degree because that was what got me through. I can tell you that much. I'd be doing, I would have been doing iron work very poorly. I would have been a horrible iron worker that everybody made fun of probably. But I was like, man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But I want to do this. This is really hard, right? This is hard. This is difficult but I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to go to practice. I'm going to do the extra workouts. I'm going to do what I need to do. And it will keep me on the straight and narrow to go to class, to have incentive, to have a purpose, right? That's really what, what wrestling did for me. I can tell you that much. And I think like what you're talking about, all the lessons you talk about and making you a better person, that's really what I got out of it. And I can tell you, I got like $1,200 in scholarship money every, every semester. And it basically paid my rent. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't like it was this big money thing. And I just don't think people really understand the money part. Are you guys fully funded by the way, coach? Uh, we're not quite, but we just got a, um, we're close. You're close. And we just got a huge influx of money in the last year that ha has really helped. Yeah. And then you guys, um, we were you like, guys, what are yeah, you? We were around half the, uh, you know, the allotted amount, right. You know, give and take each year. And, um, we have a great athletic director who, you know, everything it, it, for good reason at this, in a, the state system is about return on investment. And um, you can, you can complain for forever about your, you're at a disadvantage and you can't compete because X, Y, and Z. And it's not fair because you don't have this or you, they have this, but if you can't sit down and, show that in a meeting on paper in a way that a, a, a very educated academic is willing to sit down and listen to, then you're, you're not going to get anywhere. And um, for years, I thought that our program was worth a greater investment. And I thought there was ways to do it. And I have pleaded and begged and pushed and, you know, tried to make my case and, uh, I have an athletic director that finally made the case to upper level administrators and she crushed it. She does a great job, not just for wrestling, but all the sports on campus. 
And the reality is, this is what no administrator wants me to say. They all make money. All these programs make money, all of them. It's just a huge amount of revenue, 35 people. You, at most, you're putting 10 of them on a boat. That's 25 that pay 25 grand a year. That's, I mean, that's simple math. We spend a lot on coaches. We spend a lot on athletic trainers. We spend a lot on facilities. But the in, the revenue in, in these programs is substantial. And, and that, nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah, nobody wants to talk about how many, how many guys you have on your roster who are paying above over half, right? Because that would be the number, you know, because there's obviously going to be uh, just cost, yeah, right? Oh, yeah. And, and that, that is crazy to think about that. And I know a lot of the D2s actually have a formula. They have massive rosters. I don't. I mean, I, I know this because yeah. I, I deal with some of them. And um, their big thing is you got to have a lot more guys on the roster to draw revenue. You're drawing revenue for, for paying student athletes. Yep. They're paying to be there. They're paying room and board. They're paying tuition. This is a business. You and I get that at the end of the day, right? Yeah. I, I understand that. I understand the business end of of uh, a lot of this more than most because, you know, I got a nephew who's a college coach. I wrestled division one. He wrestled division one. I've been in this since 98. All my older brothers wrestled for Ohio state. Right. So I, I understand this. I've been, I remember I was on the ground floor when Russ Hullickson and Jim Jordan came and recruited my brothers, right. They recruited my oldest brother for, they were bringing him into Columbus to be uh, Mark Coleman's dummy. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And uh, whenever I see Jim Jordan, he always brings it up. Right. He's always like, oh, man, your dad gave you a boxing glove and he gave your other brother a boxing glove and he, your brother kicked the tar out of you. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, yeah. And then he was like, and then your dad went and bought us hamburgers from McDonald's. It was a good time. And I was like, yeah, because he's blue collar and he had no other way to, to, to really welcome you. Right. <laughs> so I've been seeing this. Right. I've been seeing this since that was in the 1986, man. Right. So I've been around the game. I understand. Yeah. I get it. And, and like you just said, there's a lot of revenue being brought in for rostered guys who aren't scholarship guys. Yeah. So it's a fact. The, what, the fact that you just brought that up on, it makes me feel better because not a lot of people want to talk about it. You know who I think has gotten better at making the case is uh, the NWCA. You know, I think Mike Moyer is like very keenly aware of that. He does a good job of, you know, when there's a program that's kind of in trouble, he does a good job of pointing that out. But I think, like, it, you have to really get an administrator's attention because what happens is they think th – this is how simple some of them really are. They think these 35 kids come here for bio and that they say, hey, this is how an administrator's mind works. While they're here, they're going to wrestle, and we're going to pay for the coach and all this stuff that costs us money so they can wrestle while they're here. But they don't understand 35 out of 35 in every single one of these programs chose this place to wrestle here you know and once they get once they understand that they're like oh wow you know that's where the money's coming from and it, it makes it a lot easier and i think i honestly think in in certain states maybe not every state but pennsylvania is a great example you can be successful and still make a bunch of money and uh you know obviously uh, a school like penn state you know their the level investment is massive Although the revenue is up because, I mean, you sell all those seats. But, um, you know, what they're doing at their RTC is kind of unprecedented fundraising. Which it's, incredible. I applaud. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. To see the numbers is incredible. Yeah. And, and the, the, the coaches that they have and the facilities that they have and the off-site facilities that they have, it's amazing. And, obviously, David Taylor shows you when you have, when you have all-out buy-in, right? Um. And then look at look at Bexad, right? You're your guy, Bexad. <laughs> a clarion yeah, guy, won, won an Olympic medal for Uzbekistan this year, a bronze at 74 kilos in Bexad Abdurakmanov, right? Yeah, uh, you, you know, know he's the Nittany Land Wrestling Club. So it's like, you know, the coach, come on, you got to beat your chest on that one a little bit. I know. I know you might not have been there when Bexad was there. I coached with him for a year. So you coached with him for a bit. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like this just He's the man. Yeah. yeah. I just literally just ate dinner with him. That's crazy. Yeah. And then his man. And then Muzafar is his brother who was at Harvard, correct? Yeah, he's at Harvard. Okay. And Backside's Nittany Land Wrestling Club for Uzbekistan. Took a bronze at seventy four kilos. That was a long time coming because he was fifth in Rio. 
but he's been a multiple time world medalist as well. Two time world uh, bronze. Yeah. And, and then Olympic bronze. That's your guy though. That's your guy, but he's in the Penn state Nittany line wrestling club system. And yeah. it's really hard for you guys to sit there and make an argument and to poach a guy like that away with the workout partners. It's unprecedented what they've done. Right. Yeah. We're talking about Clarion here, not Nittany line wrestling club. Okay. Yeah. Keep me, now yeah. we got to stay I on be track. Great. I, yeah, I want our program to be great, but I'm not. I'm I'm a rational person too. I get it. Okay, so you look at the current roster and currently what you guys are doing. You just had a massive overhaul of tipping. Um, I can't. I, I got gotta an get invite. Out here. I got listen. I got an invite to this Eagles Nest. Something about come. drinking beers and watching the yeah. duel. I my head almost exploded when I got this invite because what do you like, what kind of beer you drink? I'll make sure we got it. Well, my thing is I want to record the duel. When you're a wrestling junkie like this, you don't go and drink beer and watch the match. You go and you got a camera out and you're, 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 you're stoked that Bonesaw Brent is on his comeback tour and you get to watch high level wrestling. That's what you're there for when you're me. I'm just going to tell you that I got to put that out. I'd love to sit there and smash beers next to the mat and like talking to a microphone. Right. That'd be great, but I just can't do it. Right, I would literally have to business is business. Do the match. Well, I'll take you out after. Okay, you, come do you, that. you get my point though, right? Like I just totally. can't. I can't disrespect my sport like that. I want. I want to do what you're talking about, but I'm just so into like gathering content and and being stoked about what's going on at Tippin that I, you know what I mean. That's hard for me to do. But talk about Tippin. Talk about the overhaul. Talk about the addition to the wrestling room. You you ex- expanded by over a mat, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. We basically doubled in size. Um, I would love it. Honestly, if you came out to do a duel, if we could have you do a tour. Well, that's what I'll do. That's, that's how this works. I don't yeah, just probably, I would love that. I when I get there, I, I have this problem. The problem is I got to film everything. You ask my wife yeah, about I'll it. tell you all about it. But, uh, yeah, so we got um, – the whole building's renovated. It was like $46 million-ish. Uh, new the swimming pool got totally redone. We got a new weight room. Um, I mean, it, every inch of the building is totally redone. So it's awesome. The, what the is room's the size awesome. of the room now? What's the size of the wrestling room now? Because it was a, just like two mats. About I might four. be able to bring up a file that would tell me that. It's uh, it's three mats. Three mats. Okay. It's three like uh, they're actually legal high school circles okay. and aprons. So we could technically have like. When we have an event, we could wrestle matches in there, uh, not not college matches, but um, so three of those. And then uh, it's nice. We got cardio equipment and some like um, some stuff we use for circuits, like kettlebells and TRX stuff in the room. Um, and then the, the the one thing I really like about it is on the end of the room is a glass wall, and then there's a hallway, and on the other side of the hallway is a glass wall. So we have like this flood of natural light all the time. So it's it's very unusual i guess in wrestling rooms there's not many that have that much glass and uh we have a sprayer system and a ceiling that like for sanitizing solution that uh so we still mop it but like if guys go in there and do a workout at 10 a.m together or something they can just kick the jets on they don't have to mop it every time that is it's, awesome oh my yeah God. it's a sweet room got a bunch of uh, flat screen tvs on the walls that uh, we actually set them up with Mac, so Mac computers. So you you can like just search videos or whatever on the machines. We can like if we're running a workout there when the PIAA semis are on, we we'll kick on the you know we'll put this one mat on one TV and another mat on another. So it's cool. It's, okay, it's a good. It's a nice room. So you guys got natural light. Most rooms are dungeons. You got a you have a self cleaning system. That's amazing. I haven't even heard that one yet. Right? Yeah, that's it's awesome. Cool. Um, you did all that other stuff. And I remember that old wrestling room, dude, <laughs> it was, yeah. it was a dungeon, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause like people loved it in a weird way. Like I, I remember like Willie Saylor going off about how much he loved the clarion room. Of course he was talking about the old one, Yeah, yeah but yeah. like there was something about it that people just loved. I mean, it was the history and it was like 40 years past when it should have been renovated and they just kind of let it go. And, uh, but people, it was like a charming room, but I'll tell you what, you come see this thing and it is like, like not even, you won't even know where you're at in the building compared to where it was at before. And our gymnasium's really nice. 
Jumbotron. It, it, they did a great job on this building. I'm, I'm kind of thinking that I might try and get over there for one of these home duels. You get, you got me like on teetering on the edge right now. You guys are doing them on uh, on on the rock then, correct? We are, yeah. No free, paywall. Free on the rock free. then. What's that? Free. Free. I love it. I love yeah. what you're doing. I, oh. You know, honestly, I, I got mixed feelings about how to handle that. I'd love to talk to you off. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that off. Yeah, we can talk about it off. But listen, I want to talk about why people would tune in to watch Clary and Russell. You have the redemption tour for my guy, Bonesaw Brent. Brent Moore, ACC champion at Virginia Tech, right? Um, had some concussion yep. issues, right? Left the sport. Oh, man, I just saw a picture of, the, of all three of them last year at the NCAAs. <laughs> oh, I saw that. He's massive. He looks like he weighs 180 pounds. It may be more. I didn't bring he it up to him. Massive in that yeah. picture. And Mitch, who's at Oklahoma, yeah. Mitch is Mitch is sawed off. They're kind of built different, right? They're they're not because Mitch is super sawed off. Brent's taller and lankier, right? I'm yeah. like, oh my god. And then Nick also wrestling 49 out in JUCO in Oregon, right? So it's like, yeah. these three guys, I'm like, oh, my God. He looks like a different human. Tell me about the story of Brent Moore, why people should tune in and watch Clarion Wrestling. And talk, tell me about, like, I'm just fired up about it because he's an Ohio guy. He's a Graham guy. I'm fired up about it because I'm, an, I'm a, a redemption guy. And I know how hard this is. I know how hard it is to leave. I don't really know how hard it is I'll to get up to 190 is. pounds and jump down to 49. But talk about How do you not cheer for that kid? You know, how do you not cheer for a kid who exactly went through all that work, was working for his dad, not, not even thinking about being a wrestler again. And he just got an itch. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure out a way to, to see if I can do this. And he did. And they were like, and I watched, like, honestly, my, one of my assistants, Brock Zockerl, just hustled his butt off and explored every option, every, uh, and, and obviously we have a really good, um, compliance officer that Brock was working with to try to make this happen. And uh, they hustled and they, it, they got him eligible. And, and, you know, that was just the first step. There was a lot more to it. And I mean, you're talking about a guy that weighed what, maybe 200 pounds. So, um, you know, the one thing that like I, we had, we had decided as a staff that we were not doing a great job of on our team was like our, our weight management and just like, um, not necessarily making weight, not making weight, but just, you know, not performing great because guys were mishandling it or not being disciplined with their weight. So, like, it's kind of a, a focal point. We want to improve. That's one area we thought we'd get better. So we're running things pretty tight. And here's this kid who has to lose 50 pounds to get to his, the weight he should be at. <clears throat> so we were balancing all this and just trying to be kind of um, understanding of his situation but also kind of up against trying to be consistent with everybody on the team. And he just manned up and realized what they're trying to do is something that's important for their program. And he got tough and did not make it hard on us. You know what I mean? And he, uh, he had a much bigger task to get down to fighting weight than anybody, maybe anybody I've coached, honestly, I'm not saying that it's not the right weight for him, but he was overweight and um, he worked his butt off and got down and e each competition, it's become less of a factor. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's looking more and more like himself every single time he steps on the mat. He's had a great attitude. I, I really didn't know what I was getting into. I'll just be totally honest with you. I knew he had a history that was great in the sport of wrestling. I knew he wrestled hard. I knew he had the capacity to win huge matches. I didn't know him well personally, just from the recruiting part process is all that I got to know him. And um, I couldn't be happier that he's in our program right now. He has taken on leadership roles that I didn't even expect or, you know, it wasn't even part of the deal. He stepped up and uh, he's taught some young guys some important lessons. And, and um, yeah, he's a leader. He's good. He's good in a lot of ways. How many does he just have this year left? Because I know there's all this wacky stuff with COVID. Does he just have this year left or could he have another year? Yeah, he's just got this year. Just this year. Because you know what I'm talking about, man. It's like, yeah. it's why it is unprecedented what we're doing right I'd now. I love it. If, look yeah, at Meech. Look at Meech. Look at uh, yeah, right. Nick Soriano, right? Like, look at what Meech is, is in the eighth year, I believe. Yeah. 
that, 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 that's, that's insane, right? And we're talking about a guy who left the sport and Brent Moore because it yeah. was concussions, right? Yeah. Right? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy for him. It's the ultimate redemption story. And what I love about it is it's a clarion. It's like, you know, the clarion University yeah. of Pennsylvania. That's what I love about it. You know I'm already inclined to being an EWL guy, a former EWL guy, a PSEC guy. You already know that, right? It's how yeah. I built my business. It's how I, you know, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that no other – I'm lucky that – I said this to Win Mahalik. I'm glad that Flow Wrestling – doesn't take the ball and run i still have access to programs like you i have access yeah. to the bobcats i have access to the golden flashes in northern illinois and central michigan and cleveland state and I'm, I'm thankful for that because they haven't gobbled you guys up yet and put you under contracts i can still come and film a duel if i want to here there and everywhere yeah. right can't go in the big ten and do that right i can't put that content out there I, I, that's why I get fired up, man. You know, that's why I don't go and get drunk in the Eagle's nest and I film the duel. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's, I, I'm just super thankful for, for opportunities like that. You know what I mean? Like when I, that, that and, and I'm sure you kind of feel the same way that there's someone like me that gets fired up like that about clarion wrestling. Yeah. And wrestling. And like, I appreciate it. it yeah. I love it. It's part of what makes small school division one wrestling. So awesome. It is. It is like no other. Here's my favorite one. Um, Teague brought me in, and he got this, like, crazy – the dude was almost like a borderline obnoxious, like, in-arena announcer. Do you remember the guy I'm talking about? I think I know who you mean. It, yeah. was, it was awesome. And he, he would do the basketball games at Clarion. <laughs> And a guy mm-hmm. would hit a three pointer, and he'd be like, "Oh, he just hit that three from Dubois." <laughs> <laughs> and Fleming, James Snapper Fleming, would torture some poor person, or Beckside would kick the tar out of someone. Then this guy would go off in tipping. I was yeah. like, "This is, dude, this is what it's about, right?" And then I got yeah. to cover all those, those, you know, Oklahoma State, and Iowa, and Ohio State at at, at a. At uh, Edinburgh, right? So I got to do all this stuff in all these gyms. It was amazing, man. It was always fun. You know, Stutzman was at uh, Bloomsburg at the time. I loved that. Um, Mark yeah, Baker. He had a good run there, too. Yeah, no, he had a great run. Yeah, yeah. He had Moley, Spade. He had some really good guys, small Americans at uh, at Bloom. And it was always fun to just go cover it. And I just love the gritty style of wrestling, man. I'm just a big fan. Um, and and obviously helping me start my business and get, get – uh, get it kicked off and, and continues to enable me to be a fan and a, a media personality with it. The EWO is a big part of that. And I'll always be indebted to the EWO and schools like you guys. So I'm just pumped about it. Hey, we're getting near overtime here. Are you, are you good to go a little bit overtime with me? Uh, yeah, I'll stay on for a bit. Okay. So um, Brent Moore, obviously great redemption story. Ta- tell me a little bit more. Can you run me 25 25- 3341 all the way up to 285 and give me the preview for the clarion golden eagles this year for for 2021 2022 sure uh 25 joey fisher true freshman uh he's proving to have it you know he's learning some important lessons but for a you know guy coming right out of his true freshman beginning of the season um he's gonna be good he needs to score more points but i like him a lot uh, and he's got the grit you talked about and the thing that, that, you know, the, the, the love for winning and he's got a passion for it that is hard to teach. Is Works he a PA guy? Him. PA guy? Yeah. South Park. South Park. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we have, you know, I'll work, since, since you brought that part up, I, we have a very deliberate um, WPIL recruiting philosophy right now. And we're going for it. Those are the guys we want the most. We love Ohio why, kids. Why wouldn't you go all in on the whip heel? I don't know why you wouldn't. Pittsburgh and the whip heel is traditionally one of the top three hotbeds of wrestling. There's no question. Obviously, the Lehigh Valley has something to say about that. Northeast Ohio is great. The Central Valley in California is great. Jersey, obviously, we know that. And the Chicago lands really turned up. You know, I just named those are the five real big ones, right? Like yeah. real big ones. I'm You can make arguments for some other places, right? But when you look at it, right, I mean, Whip Hill, why wouldn't you go all in on Whip Hill, right? Yeah, and they, they like Clarion. They fit here. They, they, they make it, you know. And so, yeah. But it, 
back to the lineup. I keep getting a sidetrack. I I, hold on. I'm the king of sidetrack. I love sidetrack. <laughs> Do not apologize for sidetrack. Okay, I won't, I won't apologize. 33, uh, right now we have Alex Blake in there, and he is um, he's cut down from 41 last season. And, and quite honestly, um, he's getting better and better. He, uh, he was not very successful in past at 41. He got down. It's, it's a hard cut for him, but he's um, definitely more competitive at 33. He's fighting hard for us and getting better still. So i um, anxious to see kind of where this season leads him. Um, 41, Seth Coleno has been with the program for a while. He, he went from 33 to 49. Now he's probably at the first time he's been at the, like the right weight for him. He's at 41. Um, I think he's, uh, nine or 10 and two on the season. He won the Clarion open. He won the shorty Hitchcock. He's off to a great start. Um, this is the best I've seen him wrestle. He, he stayed here for the summer and trained hard. And uh, I think he got a lot better. Um, 49 is the bone saw. We talked about him. Love the bone saw. Big bone saw fan here. The big Moore fan. Love yeah. the Moore family. I, I'm just a fan in general. And I, I can't wait for redemption. I hope it gets that guy's way this year. Me too. Me too. He's doing a great job, like I said. Um, he won the Clarion Open. He took... I don't remember if he was second or third at Shorty Hitchcock. Uh, but, you know, he, he's, he's to the point where he, he's only losing to quality, very high quality opponents. You know, he's, he's still not probably scoring enough points to get those wins that he's going to need to be on the podium with the NCAAs. But, um, you know, he knows what he needs to do. He's actively working hard to improve in the areas he needs to. I just love his approach. He's a very mature kid in the room. And uh, you can see it. So I, uh, he's trying to make the most out of his year. And I think he's doing the right things to do that. 57, we have uh, Colby Ho, who was at 65 last year and had a pretty good season. He, uh, he transferred in. And with the COVID year and the transfer in and just a lot of things going on, he stayed up at 65 and had some success. But he's, he's more of a 57. And he's... Uh, He's had some huge wins. I mean, and he hasn't wrestled attached yet, uh, but he will wrestle on the duel tomorrow night. So I'll give you a little spoiler alert there. Where's Colby? Where did he transfer in from? George Mason. George Mason. Okay. But he's a uh, he's a local guy. He's from Dubois. Speaking of okay. Dubois. So, uh, yeah. So I'm anxious to see him in a clarion singlet and uh, on the mat tomorrow night. Uh, 65 Cam Pines, another transfer. He came in from Campbell, uh, battled through a tough field of guys to get the starting job and has been money. He, he's had some big wins. He's, he scores points. He wrestles extremely hard, does a lot of the things that we need more guys doing, quite frankly, on our team. So, uh, really, I, I appreciate having him and he was a nice addition to the team. And, you know, I think he's a national caliber kid even now, you know, so I'm anxious to watch him prove it to everybody else. 74 is John Worthing. He's, I guess, technically a redshirt freshman um, because he had the COVID year and he redshirted the year prior. Uh, you know, he's the guy who us coaches were like, man, nobody even knows really about him. And he's kind of good. You know, he's figuring it out. And, you know, we coming into the season, we all kind of talked about that, felt that way. And, you know, he'll, he's starting now to pop some wins that people are noticing. He beat, uh, he beat an All-American a couple weeks back, Turley from Rutgers. And uh, that was probably – that was definitely his biggest win of his college career. He knocked Turley off. Yeah. Where was that at? He spanked him, too. He wrestled really well. Uh, that was at Davidson. We wrestled in the quad. You see, uh, okay, I don't think people understand how important it is to get these early. And then they, they rate those wins, right? They go the gold star, silver star, bronze, right? They have that, that right? That well, the be, RPI – yeah, I mean, the yeah. RPI system has a bunch of metrics, but, um, yeah, it's huge. That, that's yeah. huge. And I, I, I wanted to mention that it's really important for your guys to get these early season matches and get ranked. I don't yeah. know if people really understand how important it is because then they, it, it, it brings 
a qualification spot to the Mid-American Conference. And then if they don't get into – so they bring four spots to the MAC, right? They get fifth. Well, that guy's still going to be in the pool to get an at-large, right? And I don't right. think people understand really how important it is to the mid-majors and the small schools to get ranked right away, big wins right away. Yeah. Because you're what you're doing is you're almost like padding and cushioning how you can perform at the MAC tournament. Maybe you have a bad weight cut, whatever. Maybe maybe you're injured, right? There's just so much. It's such a grind. I don't think people get that. It's, it's so important. important, right? Your your bid is based is based on three things: win percentage, your RPI, which is your strength of schedule, and the coaches' polls, which are really a proxy for the publication polls. You know, because that's what well, yeah. the coaches, that's the yes. sources the coaches use to, to rank guys. Yes. <laughs> so getting ranked, like you said, is is critical. And quite frankly, I'm not whining, but it's harder for a Clarion guy to get ranked than it is for a big No, it's guy. a fact. It's a fact. Of the, no, it's not. You don't need to complain. I'm saying it for you. These are critical wins right away. That Turley win right away for your 74, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge, and it it really weighs out a lot in March. And, and people just don't get this. Yep. People don't get It's really hard, and you need to get ranked right away, and you need big wins right away. Well, he's on a good start. You know, Great. he's off to a good start. He got right hurt uh, a minor injury in the Shorty Hitchcock Open, which he tried to wrestle with for a few matches, and then just got to the point where we pulled him. But he's over that now. He's he's healed up and ready to scrap. Nice. Um 84, we had a freshman come in and knock off uh, our returner there in the wrestle-off. Um, his name's Ryan Weinson, and he's battling. I mean, he's staying close with the good guys. He really is in the matches, but he's just not able to scramble with the savvy vets yet. He's not putting up points when he needs to, um, but we really like him. You know, he works extremely hard. He's always trying to score points. Uh, he's close. I really believe he's got it. You know, I think he's going to figure it out. But he's a young guy in the lineup in the fire. So who's the other guy? Um, who, looking who forward to seeing him. What's that? Who did he beat out at eighty four? You said he beat Walla somebody up. Max Wallabaugh. Okay, so you we could see either guy though. It's still kind of up in the air. Yeah. So uh, I mean, that's right a spot now, that can be earned. TBD to be determined, right? Yeah. I mean, every spot can be earned, but uh, you know, right now, Winesen's our guy. You know, I he's. Like he, he earned the spot, and we're giving him a shot to, uh, to prove he can win at the weight. So. Nice. Um, 97 is Feldkamp, who is a uh, Northern Illinois transfer. He's good. I mean, he's a very competitive guy, and he, uh, he won the Shorty Hitchcock tournament. I believe he was second at the Clarion Open. Um, he scores a lot of points. He's fun to watch. Uh, you know, the one thing like, that, that I'm noticing – is aside from the fact they win more, it's just a lot of fun coaching kids that like to score points. You know, snooze fests are you fans, no, you know, fans not a fan. <laughs> filmers and fans and everybody they can't stand the snooze fest. Well, you know who you don't ever ask? Coaches can't stand it either. Oh, they hate it. Coaches hate it, man. Coaches would rather see their guys who are wrestling like that lose. A lot of them would. A lot of them like don't want to see their guys win like that. You want to see them change. I know that. We have an award that we give out after each competition. We have two awards. One's a hard hat called the grid hat. And the other one's a hammer. And the hammer goes to the one for the guy who throws hammers, win or lose. You don't have to win to get the hammer. So that's what we're looking for is after, at each event, that thing goes to the guy. And then they eat that next week, whoever has the, the grid hat and the grid hammer are the captains for the team. Nice. I like that. We're doing things now. So. I like that. Yeah, so we're rewarding guys in our program for throwing hammers, even if they don't always win. Okay, I like it. It's important to us. So you okay? So just real quick, kind of interject. Well, let me hit heavyweight real quick. Uh, okay. Bagoli. Okay. Bagoli is uh, he 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 um, qualified for the NCAs two years ago, the COVID year that didn't happen. Uh, didn't qualify last year when the MAC had half their bids, and uh, you know we hope that he's going to be at that level this year. Okay. Going back to 97, you know, you lost one of your best guys, a guy who was in the program and Greg Bolsick, he transferred to Rutgers. What is it like to replace him? Sounds like you replaced him with a quality guy right out of the gate, right? Yeah, we got a how, good one. How hard is that though, to replace a guy like Greg? It's, I mean, it's hard. He was man 
you know, not only on the map, but he was definitely a great role model, great leader in the program and uh, super valuable to us. So, yeah, you, you know, irreplaceable to be totally honest with you. But uh, we went out and got a good one and we love Will and he busts his butt and he wrestles hard and he's good. He's winning matches for us. You guys did okay with the portal, right? We talk about the portal. Jim Anderson was talking about the portal. He was another guy that the portal didn't – that he benefited, right? You guys sounded like you benefited besides the Greg, Greg leaving, going to Rutgers. It sounds like the, the, the portal was a little more kind to Clarion than, than what I thought the portal could be, right? Do you feel like the portal – did you win? Did you lose with the, with the transfer portal? You got to be careful what you say because – Next year could be a different experience, you know, but I would say this about the portal. There was a ton of news about it. All it was was a different organizational structure. Kids could always transfer. That hasn't changed. The only thing the portal did was at the very beginning of the transfer process, you had to go to a coach and say, other schools want permission to contact me. And a coach could say, they don't have permission. That hardly ever happened. Almost everybody gave permission for a school to contact your guy. Where it changed was not the portal, but years later, whenever they basically eliminated the need for an institution to release an athlete, that's when things kind of changed because you didn't, you didn't have to sit. You could just go, you know. Yeah. Run, it's a lot the, of running and gunning. Yeah. Uh, Oh, you got – what is that? What is that? Is All that right. a phone? I had an alarm on that. Yeah, that it was a timer. Sorry about that. Well, that was – we're at the end here anyway. Last, that wasn't for you. <laughs> oh, it wasn't for me? Okay, we're at the end anyway. But tell me about the next level travel dad that is Keith Ferraro. Tell me about adventure dad. Tell me about uh, what you love to do with your, your, your kids, your wife, your family. You're a family guy. I like it. Like sometimes I've sent you texts before and you're like, you've gotten back to me like last summer um, when you guys were looking to hire another assistant, I was getting, you know, I was hitting you up and you were out. You're like, Hey, I'm out of, I'm out of service. Yeah. We're traveling. We're doing what we do. Talk about that and, and what you guys, what you do, what the Ferraros do with traveling. Yeah, it's, um, it's important. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's, something we do as a family it's something i do to fish a lot and honestly i can't really live without it so it's, a, it's something that i have to fit into the overall structure of what i do or i can't continue to do what i'm doing um we spend a lot of time in an rv uh during the lockdown when i wasn't allowed on campus we lived in an rv and uh I, me and my three my wife and my three kids dude that uh, is so awesome i'm super jealous where all did you go we are in like 40 well, we weren't, so we've been in Montana and the, I spent a lot of time in Southwest Montana, the greater Yellowstone area. Um, Red Lodge. Did you go to Red Lodge? I've been to Red Lodge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, One of my really good friends, she ran an art institute there and I used to go out and stay with her. Yeah. Really awesome, man. Great friend. Yeah. And she, she lived in Red Lodge and my brother, my dad and I, my nephews, we went and we stayed out there. It was really cool, man. Yeah. Montana is my spot. I mean, I, that's where I'm. I spend most of my free time when I get away. Uh, I'd like to retire to Montana. I actually plan to if I can still afford it. How's your glacier? What, what's your glacier experience? Has been I've like? been up there. Uh, we are actually there last summer. So we, we go out in the summers. And last summer we went out. And that was our first COVID trip, era trip. And uh, well, not, not this past summer, but the, like the COVID summer. Yeah, the COVID one. summer. I got you. And uh, took the family and we just like didn't go around people. We got all our stuff from Walmarts at pickups, you know, the, the thing they deliver it to the RV and we go. And um, we spent about five, six weeks. I mean, everything was shut down. We weren't even allowed in our office. So we, I just worked from a laptop, I did everything it. from there. I love everything about this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And then I we did it again. This was more of our institution than the, than the NCAA around November. We were doing well. We were doing really good. We were training. We thought we were doing well, but then locally we, there was an uptick in cases. Yeah. And they shut us down for like a definitive amount of time. I don't remember. It was like 
around Christmas break. There was like three or four weeks. We had just winterized the RV. And I said, I called my wife. I said, they just kicked us off campus. Get the thing cleaned up. We're going. Let's go. Let's get it. So we did it again. We went to the desert. And that was great because we were in the desert in the fall. And I've never been to the desert. We went through like all through Utah and down through Arizona. And the Grand did you go to Arches and Canyonland? Yeah, and every, yeah we, everything we could hit, we hit. We My hit. brother's I, obsessed with Moab because he's got uh, cheap. To, it's such an outstanding place. It's really it, cool. Utah, did you go to Zion? Did you catch Zion? Yes. Oh, my but God. But it was so crowded. We couldn't get that camp. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. That sucks. Um, is Southwest Montana, is that, your, is that your favorite? Is that it? Yeah. The, uh, the Madison Valley is where I want to live. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, Ennis. I don't know if you know Annis, but like uh, Paradise Valley, if I could afford it, be south of Livingston on the on the Yellowstone between Gardner and Livingston. Um, you know, obviously Big Sky is pretty cool, but Dude, Gardner's so cool. nice. Yeah. Oh my but God, Red Lodge, kind of, so nice. The sweet spot for me is Annis. It's like a little town. Okay. I know we're exactly where you're talking. Yeah. Because I do all like everything you're talking about. I've driven out. I've driven out four times. I've driven back five because I delivered a vehicle for, for, and I've taken all my nephews. Um, at one point or another, all my nephews have done it with me. I haven't done one of my sons yet. And that's obviously the main, like, that's the real goal. Right. And that was what, you know, Ian and I did, uh, we did a bunch of Oregon and California stuff and Washington stuff. And that was really fun. And then obviously Kevin Roberts is a big part. Um, I go out and do his camps. Um, I was out there this summer in Washington and Idaho. So I always try and climb mountains when I'm out there. I'm always trying to, and I know yours is fishing. What do you try and get? What's your, your big fish that you're going for? I'm a trout fisherman. A trout fisherman. Okay. I throw, we throw flies for muskies some, but I'm a trout guy. Nice. That's awesome. How old are your boys? My boys are four and five. My four-year-old just turned four at the, um, a month ago. Um, everybody thinks wow. he's older. He's, you know, he, cause he look, he's bigger and he's kind of, aggressive and he's a real piece of work and he speaks well and then uh five-year-old will be six in february and uh it's a blast man um during covid we hiked 92 days uh in a row it was either awesome. it was two to four miles for 92 days straight and it was a big part because you know um that was really like, a, that was an awesome, that was like a golden era, man. That was really awesome for me because we went to a different park every day. We had a blast. I'm really jealous with what you did. I don't know if your kids really appreciate what you did and if they're going to in the future, but what you did is so huge, Keith. That is like, you got me fired up now. You got me jealous. You got me fired up. And, and I know that area real well that you're talking about out there. And I've spent a lot of time out there. I spent a couple weeks out there in my life. And I'm a big fan. I, you know, I was an Oregon fan. I was a, an Oregon coast fan. Like I told you, my best friend moved uh, out to Portland with uh, Armstrong world industry. Now he's out of Portland and he's in Sandy, Oregon at near the base of Mount hood and government camp. But I just always loved it. And um, everything's changed a lot though. Obviously um, accessibility has changed with COVID and, like you're saying, I like to go out and just get away from people. It's really awesome, man. And Glacier, Glacier to me is, 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 uh, I'm a going to the Sun Road fan. Um, I'm just such a huge fan of, of, um, I love the California parks. Kings Canyon is a huge underrated one. Um, We're heading to the coast. The North Cascades, by the way. I've never been on the West Coast. Oh, and, my. Uh, You've never been to North Cascades. Uh, we're headed there, actually. So I'm going to – in July, we're go we have a wedding in Colorado, and we're just going to keep going. I love it. North yeah. Cascades, super underrated. I'm going to tell you that right now. Kings Canyon is hooked to Sequoia in California. Uh, yeah, yeah, Kings yeah. Canyon is, is, a, is a gem, man, because you, you go down, you got to climb, and then go down into it. And it's it's hooked to Sequoia. I'm gonna tell you right now, you could do two weeks there easy, easy. Yeah, that's the problem, man. You like you lost. Yeah, you lose your mind. Just, the West is so massive, massive, and people don't get that. I talk to those coaches a lot about that. How they're you know they're 
the, the disadvantage is built in for those guys. It's just like if you look at just what happened to Oregon State with Iowa. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, that you know, my brother Ferd was like, oh, you can't, yeah. you know, that's not Oregon State's fault, right? That, that it really isn't. It, it really isn't because you can't control the weather. And, and you know, I talked to Ian a lot about what his travel was like at Oregon State. It's just insane to think about it, man. It's insane what their travel is. It's insane what a youth wrestling kid has to do to get matches. And then a high school kid has to do to get matches. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. I'd mentioned like Ennis, Ennis Montana, just out of curiosity, when you think you're going to maybe move to a town someday, I'm looking, they have a wrestling team. So that's cool. You know, their high school is a wrestling team. It's a small town. And you, I, so I was curious, just kind of being nosy. I look at their schedule like, man, they go to like five tournaments and they're all, I mean, like eight hour drive. Yeah. You know, their high school wrestling team, they're probably loading up in a van. Crazy. It's yeah, crazy. they're going to Tri State probably in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho at North Idaho College. I had a coach, yeah, that, that coached near there at Kellogg. And uh, I know that's a big event. I don't know if they, I don't know if that, I don't remember if that was on the stage. They got another one called Raleigh Lane that's a really cool one out there. And I'm just, I'm just going to put this out there. I'd start recruiting out there if I was if I was Keith Ferraro. I'd start making a recruiting trip at least once a year out there. Well, yeah. Now you're just talking saying. my language. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. But you yeah. guys got something beautiful there too. You have the uh, Cook Forest, um, yeah. the oldest east of the Mississippi. It's the 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 highest oldest old growth in uh, the eastern United States. That's correct, right? Yeah, it's cool. We actually do a workout out there each year um, in the preseason. We have our guys uh, run a trail. That they always get lost, but it's fun. We cook hot dogs at the end. It's a pretty cool thing. We take the team out there every year. <laughs> Torture the guys, work yeah. up to the puke, and then feed them some hot dogs. Hot. I love yeah, it. it. I love it. Hey, do you guys still do Toby Hill? We do, yeah. Toby and, Hill's uh, a good little bend up from the river up to the top of the town, right? Yeah, it's nasty. It's a nasty workout. I love yeah, it. Yeah, it is. And Eric Burnett always talks about that one. Him and this uh, another Northeast Ohio guy. Actually, the school where I teach you is the only state champ there, Mike Richner. He said that him and the Mike Richner, who's from Riverside where I teach, um, him and Mike Richner had these wars, I guess, just like running because they were, they were big runners, both of them, and they were both at one, an 18 and a 26-pounder, right? Go figure. The small guys are fast. Yeah. And, uh, how it goes. And, they, and they used to uh, – have have some wars up toby hill i guess so i love it man i love hearing it um you and i are going to talk a little bit off camera here but do you got anything else for me no man I, I mean i appreciate the coverage i appreciate what you do it's it's nice to see people that love it so much you know i wish i loved it to the point where i could just set a camera up and go sit in the eagle's nest hey i'll get you there eventually. I, I know but it's just hard for me to not i i have a hard time not filming things it's a sickness but also a, a gift, I guess. <laughs> gift or, and a disability. I don't know. So, all right, Coach Ferraro, thank you for the time. Stick around. We're going to talk a little bit, a little bit off camera here about uh, the Clarion Duels coming up here and uh, the Clarion Home Duels and what you guys are going to do. And uh, I appreciate your time. Stick around, all right? Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. 